You're listening to the CD Baby. CD Baby. CD Baby. DIY. DIY. Oh. Musician. Musician. Podcast. Hey there, and welcome to episode 88 of the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast. My name is Kevin Bruner, your host for the show. And on this edition of the podcast, you're going to hear from Kristen Thompson, who is the Education Director at the Future of Music Coalition. The Future of Music Coalition, as they put it, is a national nonprofit organization that works to ensure a diverse musical culture where artists flourish, are compensated fairly for their work, and where fans can find the music they want. The coalition is involved in numerous issues, most of which directly affect independent musicians. One of the bigger issues on their plate at the moment is the issue of fair access to radio. So I asked Kristen to come on the show to talk about the -the behind-the-scenes legislation that has drastically shaped the radio landscape and what work they're doing to try and lobby public officials to correct the issue. Also, be sure to listen all the way to the end as our next roundtable edition is going to be a listener feedback episode. And I'll have all the details of what we're looking for and how you can communicate with us at the end of the show. So uh, let's get to my interview with Kristen. Well, joining me on the phone is Kristen Thompson from the Future of Music Coalition. Kristen, how are you doing? Great, thank you. Well, why don't you start things out by uh, giving us a little background of the Future Music Coalition uh, for our listeners. I'm sure a lot of them haven't uh, come across your organization yet and just why you guys exist and what you're hoping to accomplish. Sure. Future Music Coalition is a national nonprofit. We work on the issues at the intersection of music, law, technology, and policy to ensure that there's a bright future for musicians and for music fans. Uh, We started about 10 years ago in uh, June 2000, so this is our 10th anniversary coming up. Um, We were sort of born out of the the indie DIY movement of the 1990s when um, I co-ran a record label with my friend Jenny Toomey. And she and I um, were also in a band that toured a lot, and we're really um, trying to do our own thing, running our own label and putting out our own music. But in in 1998, we decided to do other things, and we closed down the label, but we could see that the Internet was really starting to change the landscape for musicians and for independent labels. So we started to do interviews with people that were, seemed to be popping up, people we didn't know from before, from the technology sector and from the Internet sector, even from, some, from the entertainment law sector. And we realized that this was a very complicated, potential, a potentially really interesting change in the environment for musicians. So... Um, We did some articles, we interviewed people, and we realized there was also this policy component to what was happening. And there was an opportunity in the late 1990s and early 2000s where musicians could really get engaged with some policies and create better structures that would ensure more compensation for musicians and more access to audiences. So that was the start, the reason why Future Music Coalition started in 2000. And in the past 10 years, we've been doing a lot of work on ensuring uh, artists are compensated in the digital future and improving access to audiences. Well, I know you guys have your hands in many issues as relate to uh, legislation and things affect artists. And one of the things that uh, you're working on is to improve access to radio for musicians and, and fair compensation when their music is played. I know as a music listener, I've kind of tuned out the radio just because it's become, you know, very similar no matter where you're at. It seems like it's the same songs over and over again. You know, the local flavor that used to exist is now gone. Can you explain and uh, give us some background of how those events maybe came about? Absolutely. So there was a critical moment back in 1990, in the 1990s. Um, In 1996, there was a law passed called the uh, Telecommunications Act of 1996. And this was a big update to um, the media ownership rules that the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, uses to um, 
you know, legislate, sort of regulate radio, Mm -hmm. uh, both commercial and non-commercial. And what happened in 1996 is there was a drastic reduction in the ownership caps that were, um, that had prior been on radio. So it meant that the national ownership cap was eliminated. That meant that any radio station owner could buy as many stations as they wanted to nationwide. And then there was a local ownership cap, too, which had meant that one particular owner could only own up to, say, four stations in a particular market. They raised that limit to eight. So in the biggest urban markets, one owner could own up to eight stations. And this had a drastic effect on the radio landscape. There was a huge amount, a very rush, a big rush to consolidate. And so some station owners that were, you know, in the past maybe owned eight stations nationwide, suddenly owned 1,200 stations. The ones that pop, that, that come to mind are Clear Channel, which become, became and still is the largest radio station owner in the country, but other um, big owners like Infinity and Radio One and Citadel um, also increased the number of stations they had nationwide. And this meant there was also a big, big consolidation in the amount of revenue mm-hmm. and the amount of audience ratings that were concentrated into the top 10 radio station owners in the country. So um, they controlled about 60% of the revenue and about 60% of the audience, just 10 owners. Mm-hmm. And the rest of it was, you know, the other, oh gosh, 30, I think it was 3,500 station owners had access to the rest of it. But what this meant for musicians um, is that this consolidating effort also, you know, there was an effort to sort of create synergies at the radio station level. And so they started um, getting rid of local um, program directors and music directors at stations. And making it sort of a regional music director. And it made it much harder for local acts and musicians to sort of get um, get in front of their local program director to um, potentially have their music heard on their local radio station. Um, There was also, as we found through some research we did, there was a lot of sort of duplication of playlists. It wasn't like there was a national playlist, but there was um, so much. Stations are very risk-averse when they get to that level of, of uh, depending on uh, on revenue really coming in from quarter to quarter to satisfy stockholders, so that um, they're very, they're very risk averse. They don't want to take risks on unheard of artists or unknown music, so they tend to go with what they know might be a hit. And usually that comes out of the major label world, where they know what they're getting, <laughs> and that there's some support behind the artists from in the in the um, major label sort of system. So. Um, we think that FMC thinks that the combination of the 1996 Telecommunications Act, which allowed these station ownership caps to go away, and then the very nature of radio being fairly risk averse and also being so um, committed to the continual, uh, uh, you know, rise of of um, revenue on a quarterly basis, meant that radio has changed. It hasn't really much about music, but more about just making money. Yeah, and I think a lot of artists may not uh, realize that, you know, a lot of the the shows they're listening to on the radio in, you know, their local town, and they hear a DJ talking, in a lot of cases, that DJ is no longer in their town anymore and could potentially be in L.A. or New York and just broadcasting almost like syndicated to all places. There's both things going on. There's a lot more syndicated programming, which kind of brands itself as syndicated programming, and then there's also um, voice tracking, which means that the DJ um, may sound like they're um, being broadcast from their, your local um, radio station, but in fact they might be piecing together the programming at their own location in their house, you know, in another state, and just plugging in the right, you know, locations and weather provided by the station that they're working for. Yeah, and those are a little harder to spot, but after a while when you realize that they haven't mentioned any direct link to your town or any uh, local events, like, you know, you used to hear it on radio, they're like, come out and see us at so-and-so on Friday yeah. night. Then you start thinking, wait a minute, where is this person? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and to me, that raises multiple issues as far as access to radio, because not only is there all that consolidation, but there's fewer and fewer people involved who may even have, you know, bring their passion for music to the table where once you used to have, you know, maybe 
five local DJs throughout the day on a particular station, when you take away all those people, there's less and less different influences being brought to the table. Yep. As, as things got consolidated, there's just fewer tastemakers at, at the radio station level. And I think we, we probably think of radio in the best terms as being a tastemaker. They're the ones that help us weed through and sift through all the things that are potentially uh, we could listen to and try and percolate up what, what they think is good and, you know, that audiences react to. And so with fewer and fewer people, sort of uh, fewer gatekeepers at the stations, it does mean that there's just fewer voices or fewer ears listening to what's potentially going to be played on the radio. Well, before we get into some more of the issues around uh, commercial radio, why don't you give us uh, a little explanation of how the, uh, commercial radio may compare to community radio or uh, nonprofit radio or college radio? Sure. So, yeah, um, there are many, many nonprofit and commercial and community radio stations in the United States. And it's really interesting to look at some of their programming because sometimes you see um, NPR affiliates and um, college stations doing the most progressive and most interesting programming in their community. And we really, I think, can rely on that. We all rely on that right now, especially musicians, because sometimes that's the best place for you to try and get your music played locally. Um, But there's also been an effort to expand the number of community radio stations available in the United States. And this is a policy issue. Um, There are low-power radio stations right now, which means that they have 100 watts. They're 100 watts, and they can broadcast in about, you know, a 4 to 10-mile radius from their station. And they need to be by, by law, they need to be non-commercial, non-profit, community-run stations. And this um, class, this license class, has been available for a while, but has been restricted to only places that are fairly unpopulated, if you will, like mostly rural areas, mm-hmm. where they know that the the, um, the frequency of the of the station won't interfere with existing um, radio stations. But um, the reason that that law exists is because in 2002, um, the National Association of Broadcasters um, convinced Congress that, you know, this interference thing was a huge issue, you know, that low-power stations being put into big cities was going to be a huge problem and that it was going to create oceans of interference. And the FCC, as a response in about 2003, hired some independent engineers to try and evaluate whether interference really was going to be an issue. And they found that, you know, with enough, um, enough um, padding around certain small low-power stations, like a couple of adjacent channels of frequency, that, that it was going to be fine, that this oceans of interference thing was just, you know, not an issue. And since then, the FCC has urged Congress to pass, to, to remove the um, restrictions that were placed on it in 2002 so it can license more low-power stations in more urban areas. And this year, in 2010, it's the closest we've ever been to seeing that happen. Um, There's uh, bills in both the House and the Senate called the Local Community Radio Act that would repeal the restrictions that Congress imposed in 2001 and allow the FCC to license, to make the licenses available. And um, so FET Future Music Coalition has been very active on this issue, and lots of musicians and other media reform groups are working hard to see this bill, the Local Community Radio Act, get to the president's desk. And I'm assuming that the, uh, the application process to get licensed by the FCC is not an easy one. There are folks who can, can help you understand if there was a local community that wanted to try and do, uh, try and um, apply for a low-power FM license. There are folks like the Prometheus Radio Project that can um, help you understand the process. It's a, little, it's a lot of paperwork, and you need to actually hire an engineer to help you understand it. But Prometheus um, has helped, gosh, dozens of community groups not only get the licenses, but also build the radio stations. And um, they've built them in Oregon and in Florida, and even internationally. And um, they're a really wonderful organization that does excellent work to try and try and just expand the number of community radio voices in the, in the country. I'm, I'm curious to know if uh, you're familiar with the radio station KCRW or KEXP. Yes. And the thing that I find interesting about those is they're both, I believe, nonprofit stations. They are both. They're both community-supported nonprofit stations, yep. And the thing that I find interesting about them is they have become pretty big tastemakers in the music community 
and have pretty diversified programming and even have found a huge audience over the internet. I'm just uh, interested in if you have any insights on why they're able to make it work the way they do as opposed to why, you know, big commercial radio insists on its consolidated programming and stations and it seems like it's losing its relevance Mm -hmm. where these stations are doing it a different way and are gaining relevance. Yeah, I agree with you that KEXP and KCRW are really um, great things for musicians and um, even music programmers to look at as examples of how people who are doing ambitious programming can really be successful at it. And especially on the Internet, because I know, at least in KEXP's case, they were fairly early movers on being able to webcast their streams in a number of different different formats. So that, um, And then I I believe the KEXP's audience, sort of at the membership level, is a bit greater outside of Seattle than inside it. Uh, But I'm not sure. (laughs) You'd have to check with KEXP. That wouldn't surprise me, because I know that people listening over the Internet, they've got a huge audience. Yeah, so... Another interesting thing is, too, I think NPR itself and their NPR music programming has really started to shine and that they are, again, becoming tastemakers of their own, mostly because I think all of these things, the things they have in common is that they're seeing the Internet as a, um, something that can facilitate and actually improve their access to audiences, mm-hmm. and they're really smart about their, their web interface and that they you know, actively use their websites to, to blog about music and to you know, promote little shows that they webcast and, um, and that they also support community efforts. For example, if you're on the KEXP website and you like what you hear, you can go to their rolling playlist that's real time and see, oh, that audience, that, that art, artist I just heard was this. I can buy the song off of iTunes or Amazon or I can buy it from my local Seattle-based record shop. And I think all of these things combined together are things that, uh, in some cases, commercial radio has just sort of either never really fully explored or just hasn't in- implemented at the local level. Mm-hmm. So I think um, radio could really learn from this. And another thing that radio could learn from, and in fact they're watching closely, is the explosion of interest of around Pandora, um, which is a webcast service mm-hmm. um, that creates customized radio stations for their audience. And um, Pandora has a huge audience base now and was really smart in having a very early having an iPhone app and other applications available to make it mobile and getting himself installed in, in um, dashboards, you know, making um, arrangements with Ford and things like that to um, ensure that you could have Pandora easily accessible in your car means that they've moved off the desktop and into mobile devices and in cars, which has primarily been radio, commercial, over-the-air broadcasters world for years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, so, again, I think it's that these stations have been really smart about using technology to increase their audience size and, you know, been very ambitious about their programming. You had mentioned how Pandora is in cars now and they're, they're making their way. They've, they're on mobile devices. They're getting into cars with some new car models that are out there. And so, obviously, commercial radio is starting to actually see... Um, some challengers out there with kind of the shift in how people interact with music. What progress has been made since the 1996 Telecommunications Act as far as like, has there been any progress to kind of rein that in with some of the work you guys have been doing and involved in? The Telecommunications Act of 96 still remains the um, the definitions by which commercial uh, and even non-commercial, well, the, the definitions by which the FCC regulates radio. Um, now, there have been um, calls to rein in consolidation by a number of media reform groups, um, but the, I think the interesting thing is, is that um, it's, the commercial radio seems to have collapsed under its own weight in a way, that um, the efforts to consolidate and to streamline and to take advantage of synergies and things like this, um, let's just use Clear Channel as an example, because in addition to um, acquiring 1,200 radio stations in the early 2000s, they also tried to buy and own um, lots of the concert promotion world. And they spun that off in a few years after that because they realized that the synergy that they assumed that could happen between radio and concert promotion just really wasn't, they weren't really, it wasn't really working. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was probably too expensive and too risky to try and 
to try and run a big concert promotion um, system as well as running radio stations. So they spun that off, and that became Live Nation. So I think even though the regulations still allow for this amount of consolidation, we've seen Clear Channel in recent years um, uh, sell some of its stations. We've also seen a lot of stations bordering on or entering bankruptcy, um, a lot of station groups. So it seems like um, the effort to consolidate may have backfired in a way, and that some of these station groups that grew too large are now realizing they had they have too much, uh, too many assets. Let's say. So do you think that there's change on the horizon? Some of the change may just happen because of the environment, the economic conditions that some of these radio station groups are now facing, mm-hmm. um, bordering on bankruptcy. There's some of them are, some of them are you know cutting more staff. And some of them are trying to sell their stations and realizing there's no buyer at the time. Um, but the FCC is actually um, starting another, a quadrennial review of the radio station and media ownership um, laws. So this happens starting this year. And as a precursor to it, in, the, in uh, November and December of 2009, they actually held some roundtables and some meetings at the FCC's headquarters in D.C. to try and, you know, ask people from the... from the academic world and from the media reform world and from the broadcaster world, you know, what should they be looking at and how should we proceed as we move ahead in this quadrennial review. And I think it was a very interesting process because um, some of the folks talked about um, the SEC actually, in the most basic sense, needs to improve their ability to collect data about the stations that they are regulating. There's um, the databases they use are a bit antiquated, but even having access to better data would make, help us understand the radio um, ownership landscape better to try and understand how many, say, minority owners there are, how many women my, uh, owners there are, and things like that. Because the FCC, in addition to caring about um, competition, they, should, they, by mandate, care about localism and diversity. And it's been really hard for them to serve as the regulator that cares about those things because they just don't have the information they need to to actually do the right job. Mm -hmm. But I'm really confident that this new SEC that's being um, uh, chaired by uh, Julius Janikowski is doing a really good job to try and um, make the FCC more effective at what they do. Well, I know that a lot of artists indie artists that are out there and making albums and promoting their music have pretty much written off radio just because they they see the the big commercial radio world uh, not allowing them access. And um, But I know it's frustrating for the artist community because radio is still probably the number one way to reach a broad audience quickly, um, even though I know a lot of people... Uh, have tuned out a lot of the commercial radio just because of the the same playlists over and over and just uh, not a lot of new music coming in. Um, have you seen artists doing interesting things to to capitalize on some other avenues of radio, maybe local radio, community radio, or nonprofit radio? Yes. Um, I agree with you. I think that um, the reason that radio is so um, sought after is that it is, you know, your your local megaphone it it can be so um, it can be such a big boost to an artist's career to get heard on commercial radio and um, and it can make a big difference in the amount of records you sell and and even the kind of places you can play shows so the reason that we all want to get heard on the radio too because it sounds like you've um, you know demonstrated your <laughs> you know yeah I'm I'm worth it I can be played on radio mm-hmm. but there's so many more avenues for artists to actually get heard in a radio setting these days. You know? So I think a lot of people are moving around the commercial radio aspect and really um, trying to appeal to very niche genres. For example, um, maybe your music is, um, could be heard on NPR stations. And going through the NPR music website, you might be able to figure out if there's a show, a specialty show, or NPR music itself where you could try and send your music to to get played because they're way more... Um, interested in hearing new music. Then there's satellite radio. Um, it still has a fairly wide, large, I think there's 20 million subscribers to Sirius XM right now, and they have a lot of niche programming. And um, at, at Future Music Coalition events, um, we've had folks from Sirius XM, some programmers there, to talk about, um, to talk about how, you, how musicians should approach um, Sirius XM. And they said, you know, be prepared. 
make sure you're directing your, your CDs and your um, promotional materials to the right program directors, to the stations, I mean, to the, well, the stations that actually make sense for the kind of music you play. Mm-hmm. But again, they're, they're more ambitious, and they certainly are playing new music. And then there's college radio stations, and then there's non-commercial radio stations like KEXP and KCRW and places like that that play a lot of music. Mm-hmm. Um, there's the National Federation of Community Broadcasters has a list of all the community radio stations in the country. And then there's all the webcast stations. And that means that they may not have a physical presence in the world, but they're webcasting live, and there's so many that have a huge audience, you know, um, some on... Uh, and some of them are very niche-oriented, but um, it's about doing a little research and figuring out where other people who love particular genres and, or styles of music are listening and how to get your music to those program directors. Yeah. Do you have any advice for artists who are, you know, they have an album and they're going to try and reach out to some of these local stations, some of these uh, maybe bigger uh, nonprofit stations. Is there any quick little pieces of advice you can give them about uh, reaching out to them and in ways that might return a little bit more success? Well, I can only pass along the advice I've heard from others in the radio programming world and from the folks at, at Sirius XM. It seems like there were a few things that um, they really looked for with musicians, you know, that the music was good and that your package is simple, but um, descriptive enough, meaning there's a CD in there and it has a one sheet about what you do, um, that it's directed to the appropriate people at the stations so it doesn't get lost in the box of, oh, this is the wrong format for us or, you know, oh, I don't, you know, this isn't my genre. Mm -hmm. Um, And that that you label your CDs and that you have the track listings appropriately uh, on the packaging and on the CD itself because sometimes those things get separated at the stations and loaded into databases. Um, and that um, if you have tour dates you're planning around um, that's time sensitive, that you try and think strategically about when you send things out so that the timing is right for your tour or for your record release. Um, so I think those are the things. I think um, with, as, as things get more digital, um, there's, and, and CD Baby is so excellent at this, uh, in sort of helping your um, musicians understand this is that having good metadata about yourself Mm -hmm. is really important because as things get more digital, it gets spread out widely. And you want to make sure that when you enter things into databases that you do it right Mm -hmm. the first time. Are you finding that uh, most stations are still requiring a physical CD to submit music? Uh, As far as I know, they are. But um, I've heard of some labels trying to change that to try and get um, stations to accept digital files. Mm -hmm. I think it all depends on the station's ability to have, you know, big databases and big hard drives Mm -hmm. um, and, and the software to run a music selection service like that. In your opinion, are there going to be any big changes in, in radio in the next couple of years, or do you think it's just going to kind of hold status quo for a while? I think the biggest change might be the passage of the Local, local Community Radio Act. Um, I, from what we can tell, and just from the media reform community's understanding of this, um, is that this is the farthest the bill has ever gotten, and it seems like this might be the year it actually passes through both the House and Senate, which mm-hmm. would be just so exciting. Yeah. Um, the only other thing that might happen this year, which would be also be really good, is um, the passage of the um, the um, Performance Rights Act, which would um, establish a um, public performance right for sound recordings, which means that um, performers of music that gets played on the radio would get a royalty when their music's played on the radio, as opposed to just the songwriter and the publisher. Mm-hmm. Um, this is an anomaly in the United States law that has existed for decades, and that um, even, you know, there's a performance right in most of the other sort of westernized and even Asian countries that allows performers and songwriters to get a royalty. So getting the Performance Rights Act passed would mean we could fix that and more royalties would not only flow to performers in the United States, but also all these royalties that are collected overseas, like say your music's played in France, um, they can flow back and forth because the rights would be reciprocal Mm -hmm. with the other countries. So getting that passed would be great. Future Music Coalition is a big supporter of this bill going forward. And uh, the more artists that support the work, the uh, better chance we have at actually seeing it passed. 
I've seen commercials with the radio stations calling it a tax. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the passage of that bill would would drastically affect their bottom line in a way that might put some of them out of business? I, I think not. Okay. Um, I'm all, we're also very sensitive to the you know the the, the radio stations um, you know budgets and things like that. But there are it's a sort of a tiered system a, a tiered system so that I think it's stations under. $1.5 million of gross revenue, say you're under that amount, you, you have a minimum payment requirement of only $500 a year. Um, and stations above that clearly are, you know, have a fairly big revenue um, source, and so there's a different structure of payment. But um, it's a, just a, per, a tiny percentage of their overall budget that they pay the, both the performance rights societies for the songwriters and potentially to the performers. Um, and so in the scheme of things, I think it's only a small portion of the money they'd have to pay every year. And to be honest, if, if they're a, a music-driven radio station, it's the majority of their, what would you call it, their, you know, the inventory they yeah. have to present to people. Yeah. So we, we think it's only fair that they... Um, pay for it. Yeah. Both those pieces of legislation will be interesting to watch and see what happens in the, hopefully in the coming year. Um, before we close out, what other issues are you guys working on at the moment that, uh, um, that our artists might find interesting and, and also where can they find out more about, about what you're up to? Sure. The other big one we're working on is um, supporting the FCC's efforts to create um, some rules about the open internet. Um, there's um, a phrase that lots of people might have heard called net neutrality that would, um, it basically means that, that there, the internet is considered a free and open infrastructure that the different um, sort of companies that control the internet wouldn't have a chance to intervene on the content as it moves from place to place. It's kind of like you think when I dial a phone number and I call you know, my mother, AT&T isn't in getting in the middle to try and, you know, slow down my conversation with my mother or anything like that. It's just um, an exchange between two different numbers. Um, so right now the, the FCC is considering some rules where um, they would allow them to sort of understand and sort of give a framework to how the open Internet would work and what the FCC's responsibilities are as the regulating body. Um, so it's a long process. They're just starting. They've been um, asking for comments from the public and they'll move ahead with some recommendations in the next few months. So we're working on that. And we're getting, lots of artists have submitted comments in the process, including R.E.M. and Aaron McCallan and um, Pearl, uh, OK Go, and bands like that that have really recognized that having an open Internet structure has really helped them with their careers. You know, even bands like R.E.M. see it as, hey, we run, we you know, communicate with th tens of thousands of fans. We are running our own... Um, sort of network for for fans, and then Erin McCowan's been so creative and inventive with the way she uses webcasting and um, running her own her own stuff to sort of promote her own shows and her music. And OK Go, of course, with all their videos, mm -hmm. has shown how how important the vid the um, internet is to building a career. Mm -hmm. So we're working on that, um, and. We've also been following some big international issues involved with um, international copyright treaties, but that stuff is a lot of detail. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure we'll have uh, uh, you or someone else on the, from the coalition back on the, the podcast soon to discuss some of those other issues because uh, I know our listeners will find them interesting as well. So I appreciate you taking time out of your day to be on the show. Thank you so much. And, uh, folks who are musicians can always visit our website at futuremusic.org to check out more information. All right. That's going to bring us to the end of another episode. If you'd like to find out more about the Future of Music Coalition and what they're up to, you can find them on the web at futureofmusic.org. Well, in the last roundtable edition of the podcast, we kicked around the idea of doing a listener feedback show, and that's what we're going to do for the next episode. There are several ways your voice can be heard. One, you can call our listener line at 206-426-5683. That's 206-426-5683. 
You can email us at info at cdbabypodcast.com or you can leave a comment in the show notes for one of our recent episodes. I'll be looking through those and sharing some of them on the podcast. The show notes are, of course, found at cdbabypodcast.com and you'll also find the phone number there as well if you forgot it. No matter uh, what method you choose, the comments and calls relating to uh, the most recent episodes will take priority. But if you have a good story to share, whether it's a success story or a mistake story, we want those as well. We love hearing those. For calls, try to keep them within a minute as that will allow for us to get a lot of folks on the show Um, And, you know, there's been times where there's been a great call, but it goes on and on and it's just too much editing work to get it on the podcast. So keeping it a minute to a minute and a half. And if you can call from a landline, that helps as well, just so it's not all garbled. I think that's everything. So uh, next time, listener feedback episode, please contribute your thoughts and comments and uh, we'll catch you then. See you. been listening to the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast, broadcasting from Portland, Oregon, USA. 